This is the Wow Signal Podcast, a production of Dream of the Open Channel. It's March 2013, and this is Episode 5, The Superior Galactic Communities, The Search for Bracewell Probes, Part 1. Welcome, this is your host, Paul Carr. This episode of the WOW Signal Podcast will proceed a bit differently than the previous four, and we'll also pick up a different thread, the search for Bracewell probes. First, let's establish a little context and make plain a working assumption. The context is that, as we discussed in episode two, our galaxy is much older than we are. We've only been spaceflight capable for about 55 years, and that only crudely, with brute force, chemical rockets, and a little low-thrust ion propulsion doing all the work. If we encounter another technical civilization, it is highly probable that they have been at it much longer than we have. Either that, or the last term in the Drake equation, L, the average lifetime of technological civilizations, is so short that would be we would be unlikely to encounter anyone. So, if we assume that age is strongly correlated with advancement, and it seems it must be at least up to a point, then they are also overwhelmingly likely to be more advanced than us. The working assumption I'd like to talk about now is that interstellar spaceflight, while possible, never gets easy. There is simply no way at all to cheat the speed of light, or if there is, it is inherently expensive and not frequently attempted. From everything we know about physics and astronomy, crossing the vast gulfs between the stars is hard. Very hard, and especially hard if we want to send flesh and blood humans across to even the nearest stars. As a civilization, we have just begun to study how we would go about this, and all serious people agree that the problems are daunting, and that we are far from ready to attempt it. When we do give it a try, we will almost certainly send robots first, and probably very small robots, because the energy requirements for traveling at speeds even just 10% of the speed of light, about 30,000 kilometers per second, are immense. History, however, is on our side. We tend to underestimate short to medium term challenges, but we also underestimate long term achievements. We simply fail to imagine how our descendants will creatively tackle problems in the future. We can't solve those problems for them. But what we can do is give them the best possible platform to fly away from. Perhaps interstellar flight is something our grandchildren will earnestly tackle. The first such flight is likely to be only to the closest stars, at a small fraction of the speed of light, and with no human passengers. The one-way payload will be the smallest robot we can come up with that can survive the journey and phone home once it arrives, possibly more than a hundred years after it departs. Most likely we would send a constellation of three or more of these so they can keep an eye on each other and inform us about the details when something goes wrong with one of their constellation partners. At any rate, if we do ever send biological human descendants to another star, it will always be far easier to send robots. As we discussed in episode three, We may transcend our biology at some point, and this would be moot. Our robots are us. One day, talking about advanced robots as mere machines may be regarded as barbaric. So, what are Bracewell probes? Bracewell probes were first conjectured by Stanford University's Ronald Bracewell, and hence the name in a short paper in the journal Nature in 1960 called Communications from Superior Galactic Communities. 
This is when the idea of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI, though still regarded as a bit fringy, had received some serious scientific support and had at least a subset of the scientific community excited. I'll now read a few key excerpts from that paper. After discussing the current research on SETI, Bracewell points out that there are, uh, if we really believe there are superior communities out there, we might want to think about what they've done to to reach us besides radio communications. In the fourth paragraph, he writes, Would not this other, more advanced society, on the contrary, be doing what we ourselves are now discussing and are on the point of doing, probably during this century, namely sending probes to nearby stars? Their exploration and other activities would be intense in their immediately neighboring planetary systems, Beyond their immediate neighborhood, it might be feasible for them to spray some number of suitable stars, say 1,000, with modest probes. Now, we now know that we didn't send any interstellar probes out in the 20th century, but as we've discussed, um, we're often optimistic about our short-term achievements. Paragraph or two down from there, he says, For this reason, we might better devote our efforts to scrutinizing our solar system for signs of probes sent here by our more advanced neighbors. In this way, we would be effectively paying attention to all stars capable of reaching us. Such a probe may be here now, in our solar system, trying to make its presence known to us. For this purpose, a radio transmitter would seem essential. The probe could first listen for our signals and then repeat them back. To us, its signals would have the appearance of echoes, having delays of seconds or minutes. The important thing for us is to be alert to the possible interstellar origin of unexpected signals. We must avoid relegating them, if they are there, to the fate of a very strong emission from Jupiter on the order of 1,000 megawatts per megacycle per second, which were heard and ignored for decades. And finally, at the end of the paper, Bracewell writes, On the other hand, the prospect of catching a technology near its peak might be a strong incentive for them to reach us. So, bracewell probes are hypothetical spacecraft from another civilization, a robotic advanced guard sent here from a long way away to keep an eye on our planet for possibly a very long time. Bracewell envisioned that when the time was ripe, the probe would make contact with us and endow us with at least some knowledge from the superior community. Bracewell probes still seem like a sensible way for superior communities to reach out in their galactic neighborhoods, whether their intentions are benign or defensive, rather than guessing when to send probes to check out a suspect solar system, and then possibly being too late to the party. They simply strike out for all of them in the neighborhood and then wait. Would their purpose be, as Bracewell conjectured, to enlighten us or simply to alert the rest of the superior community that here there be uppity apes? If the Bracewell probes were also self-replicating, they could spread throughout the galaxy, 
and there could be one or more such probes in every promising solar system. However, Jeffrey Landis has argued persuasively against the likelihood of this in his paper on the Fermi Paradox that we discussed in Episode 2. And this from the final paragraph of that paper. Tipler argues that an extraterrestrial technical civilization will fill the galaxy with self-reproducing probes, which will not be subject to a distance horizon. Since we have not yet learned to design such machines, it is difficult to critique this reasoning in depth. However, I suggest that a self-reproducing probe would likely be more complicated than a dedicated probe, e.g., by as much as an automobile factory is more complicated than an automobile. If this is so, then to produce maximum information return in any finite time, no matter how large, making self-reproducing probes which produce self-reproducing probes is not the optimum strategy. The optimum strategy is that after some number of generations G, the factory probes will produce dedicated probes instead of self-reproducing probes. The number G will depend on the reproduction time, trip time, ratio of complexity, and information return time, but in general is quite small unless the required information return is many orders of magnitude larger than the trip time, which is unlikely to be the case. There could well be multiple Bracewell probes originating from each of several home worlds in our solar system, some defunct, others active, and possibly unaware of each other's presence. The likely arrival window would be any time in the last two and a half billion years, roughly since the time Earth had detectable oxygen in its atmosphere, and possibly sooner, depending on what was happening on Mars or Venus. Early arrivers would probably have been pounded into inoperability by now from meteor hits, radiation, and just good old-fashioned entropy. Even self-repair systems will eventually break down. Of course, there may be some virtually magical way of to keep a system running. Virtually forever, with essentially no resupply. So I can't say it's impossible that there is a two-billion-year-old probe in our system that still functions. These older probes, derelict or not, would be the most interesting to find, since they presumably would contain data about the ancient Earth. We can't say for sure that they are out there, but we want to find them, don't we? We do, and not just because it would be a challenge or that it would prove that we are not alone, or just because we might find within them a shortcut to tremendous new knowledge, or just because we are a sense of wonder junkies. We just want to. Because alien probes. This episode of the Wow Signal podcast is a first crude move toward mapping our ignorance of these hypothetical machines. We can't know what Bracewell probes are yet, or even if they exist at all, but perhaps we can constrain or at least make some reasonable assumptions about what they could be, and that could help us find one. If we can formulate a clear hypothesis about these probes and still fail to find them, that will give us more information. Maybe scientific journals aren't excited by negative results, but we can learn from them. So, how do we find them? We need to know both where and how to look.
The solar system is larger than we intuit. So large that just poking around in it in search of Bracewell probes is overwhelmingly likely to fail, even if there are a lot of probes out there. We need to define possible observables for Bracewell probes, primarily in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum, in order to make a search at all practicable. Do we already have observational data archived away that could give us some candidates if we knew where to look? There are so many variables in how they would be implemented that it is a daunting problem to estimate the parameters of a search. Here are just some of what we need to consider. How many probes are there in our solar system? The answer could be anywhere from zero to a large number that would depend upon the other variables below. Are they diverse or essentially all the same design? Are they self-replicating or self-repairing? If so, they would need materials. A low energy cost for a rendezvous with small bodies may drive them to the asteroid belt. Whether self-repairing or not, how long would they be designed to last? Do they harvest local energy or bring their own power supply with them? How large are they? They could be tiny if they were just dropped off here, or if they still have their propulsion systems attached, very large, perhaps kilometers in size or even larger. How far from the sun would they need to orbit? Would they want to get close to the terrestrial planets? Billions of years ago, Venus or Mars may have looked as habitable as Earth, and maybe more so. Or, perhaps they would park themselves on a high elliptical orbit, only swooping by the inner solar system from time to time to check on things. Now, here are a few things I think we can take as working assumptions until we know more. We haven't yet found a Bracewell probe. Please correct me if I'm wrong about that. This places weak constraints on their size and how noisy they are in the electromagnetic spectrum. The probes would not need to land or even enter the atmospheres of planets, although there could be a secondary mission to do that. Everything you would need to know about whether a planet harbors technologically sophisticated organisms can be learned by remote sensing from orbit. It would not be necessary to visit each planet frequently. Even once per century flybys might yield sufficient information to tell what is happening on each planet. However, once it became clear that Earth was the only good candidate, probably billions of years ago, it might make sense to redesign for more frequent surveillance of the single planet. When we come back, we'll play Alien Engineer and try to create a set of straw man Bracewell probe requirements and an operational concept. Let's start with what we imagine some of the top-level requirements would be for a Bracewell probe. Since it is reasonable to assume the probe will be costly and take a long time to cover the distance between stars, its lifetime on arrival will need to be long, at least 1,000 Earth years, and maybe orders of magnitude longer. We don't know how long such a machine could be built to last with advanced technologies, possibly millions of years using autonomous maintenance and use of in-situ resources. 
The probe will be required to make close observations of key candidate planets in the target system in order to be able to detect the presence of sentient life forms there, often enough to monitor changes on a reasonable time scale. This will require the capability to modify its orbit. A classic Bracewell probe will be required to make contact with any sentient beings in the solar system once they are deemed sufficiently sophisticated to understand the information the probe contains within itself and mature enough to handle its implications. There is a problem that the builders of Bracewell probes would probably anticipate. There are power interests that would attempt to acquire the probe and the knowledge it contains and to conceal it from the rest of humanity, maybe even using it against them. There are several possible approaches to this eventuality that the designers might take, and it makes finding them even more complicated. Now let's consider a concept of operations, or CONOPS as we call it in the trade, for a Bracewell probe. As usual, there's more than one way to do it. But let's go over a broad plan that seems to work and is consistent with what we think we know about physics. This is part of what I call a reference architecture. If you think any part of it doesn't work, I'd like to hear from you. First, after a very long journey that could have taken hundreds or even thousands of years, what is probably a relatively massive propulsion stage arrives in our solar system after a long period of deceleration. The first perihelion could be fairly close to the sun because that is more efficient and because telescope data would have indicated the presence of inner rocky planets. The first orbit is probably highly elliptical, taking the probe far from the sun after a first pass of a few weeks or months to observe the terrestrial planets. Shortly after arrival, the interstellar propulsion system separates, perhaps to move on to another star system with another probe, or to simply be discarded and retired, while still moving in a trajectory that takes it out of the solar system. Note that we have assumed only one probe here. It might make sense to drop off more than one, since random collisions with solar system objects are more or less inevitable over long stretches of time, and the odds of just one surviving go from good to poor if we plan to camp out in the solar system for a very long time. Once in the long period orbit, the probes will need a propulsion capability to be able to set up its orbit for close encounters with the terrestrial planets. Unless the probe is very large, it will likely need to get close to candidate planets to monitor activity of the life there. Occasional flybys lasting a few hours should be sufficient to gather all the data required when a planet is in a phase of purely biological evolution with no culture. Once human culture emerged on Earth, more frequent flybys might make sense. The slow march of civilization might be best observed by noting changes on the surface and in the atmosphere, changes taking place over years or decades rather than millennia. For very long live probes, this would argue for lowering the aphelion to allow for more frequent flybys, perhaps somewhere just beyond the orbit of Saturn. Eventually, the probe might park itself somewhere by landing on a moon or asteroid, thus reducing or eliminating the need for its aging subsystems to maintain attitude stability. At some point in the mission, the probe has responsibility for autonomously deciding whether or not to establish contact with any technologically savvy beings in the solar system. Bracewell speculated that this would be done by echoing terrestrial radio or television transmissions with a delay that could only come from deep space. Whether this would work is not clear, since we generally don't listen for our own transmissions. For this con-ops, there are some places we would not expect to find a Bracewell probe intact. The surface of Mars, for example. It went dry billions of years ago, and there would never have been any incentive to land on Mars, given our mission of searching for intelligent beings. Mars may have once have harbored life, but it would be very surprising if it were ever more complex than plankton. Certainly, we have seen no trace of such a probe yet from the various landers and rovers that image the surface of Mars at close range.
For similar reasons, we would say the same about Venus, which, as we discussed in Episode 4 with David Grinspoon, may have once been habitable on its surface, and may still be habitable in its clouds. The major observables here that we're really interested in are in the electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum can be observed with telescopes or radio telescopes from the Earth or from satellites without having to actually go and visit the places that we, where we might find the probes. We could conceivably find a probe in situ, parked on an asteroid or moon. But even then, the major means of detection would likely be optical or infrared long before we touch and sample it. The electromagnetic spectrum, for our purposes, divides up into the low-energy radio frequency end, infrared optical, and and the high-energy X-ray and gamma-ray end of the spectrum. Strong radio emissions are likely to be episodic, if at all. If the Bracewell probe decides to contact us via the radio spectrum, finding it will be easy, problem solved. If it has to phone home using radio frequencies from time to time, we would not likely intercept very much of that energy here on Earth for geometric reasons. I am assuming that they would have advanced, highly efficient antennas. There could be weak radio emissions at a specific frequency due to hyperfine transitions of helium-3. Helium-3 is a stable isotope of helium and is a possible byproduct of a fusion reactor, or it could even fuel an advanced reactor itself. One of the products of that reaction are protons, which are easy to manipulate with magnetic fields, and so you could conceivably get a much more efficient reactor with helium-3. This is at the end of a long list of assumptions, but could make for a clear signature for something artificial. Traces of mining for helium-3 on the moon or an asteroid could also betray the presence of a probe. Almost any probe with an active energy source will have an infrared signature that varies from a natural object. If it is a compact, high-energy source, it could be quite bright in IR. This will depend upon energy requirements for propulsion and communications. Specifically, the probe might be much hotter than a natural object at that distance from the sun. The visual signature is more complicated because it depends on so many variables. But distance from the sun and physical size are key. These days, we routinely spot objects a few meters in size when they come near the Earth, and even amateur astronomers can sometimes see them. However, distinguishing a Bracewell probe from a small asteroid or discarded rocket body isn't easy. If the probe is very large, the problem of seeing it gets easier at the same distance from the sun, but we still would not know how to distinguish it from many thousands of natural objects of comparable size orbiting the sun. The high energy signature may be of considerable interest, since an X-ray or gamma ray source in orbit around the sun would clearly be a candidate for an artificial object. If the probe uses fusion or antimatter energy, then it would very likely produce some high energy photons. An advanced reactor would probably absorb nearly all of these. So we may be back to IR. If we find a Bracewell probe, even a very old and badly damaged derelict probe from an extinct civilization, it would be the most important discovery for a generation on either side. We could only begin to imagine what we would learn from it. In the next podcast of this series, we'll talk about the best practical ways we can detect Bracewell probes now, piggybacking on astronomy, planetary science, and planetary protection assets.
now, the Wow Signal Podcast, seal of podcast approval for podcasting as part of the podcast. The second Wow Signal Podcast, seal of approval for podcasting, is awarded to Oh No, Ross and Carrie. Ross Blotcher and Carrie Poppy's tagline is that they show up so you don't have to. And they do. These brave young investigators do everything from joining cults and religions to having their fortunes told, often with painful or awkward results. And then they talk about their investigations in depth on this podcast, which is produced at the Center for Inquiry in Los Angeles. I like Ono, Ross, and Carrie because the stories are often funny and interesting, and also because it really shows how to apply skepticism and critical thinking in real situations with real people and without being a jerk. Although Carrie drops the occasional F-bomb, both she and Ross are really nice people who often end up liking the characters they interact with on their investigations. They are good role models for young skeptics. In the show notes, I will have a link to my blog post titled, What Skepticism Isn't. One thing skepticism isn't is snark, and Ross and Carrie display remarkably little snark, though at times they must be sorely tempted. You can find out more about Oh No, Ross and Carrie at www.onopodcast.com. I'll have a link in the show notes. Why don't you give them a listen? You have just heard the Wow Signal Podcast, podcast seal of approval for podcasting as part of the podcast. I'll have a few closing announcements, but first, a bit of fun. Now, one, two, three, so- to tell. Some girls are born with intimate skills. Some girls are just concerned with fun. Some girls are like an SNL skit at a quarter to one. What I need is a two-sided coin. She better satisfy my brain as well as my loins. She better wear a tight dress and have a mind that's strong. I want brains and a body. Is that so wrong? When she shows me her brain cells, then my pride suddenly swells. Like a Botticelli chick, she's on the half shell, but she likes getting nasty like Tori Wells. Brains, body, bones. is very good to try and retain and impress, but I also don't mind a vinyl dress, so which is watching Japanese, she never has to guess. You may ask why I'm specific, well dumb girls make me soporific, I need a brain and a vibe that are both terrific, like a domain name that's case specific. She's the queen of conversation, a panel man for round face the nation, but she gets on all fours without hesitation, and she got the best seat without a reservation. She goes to museums like Whitney to learn about the pigment at the installation. She also knows as Morgan Stern is a figment of imagination. She always puts her as before the car. She can make a point like George Surratt. She can choke the chicken like Julia Child. And she knows how to make my ice cream. Brains, body, bow. 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 She got brains and a brick house pot to behold. She knows Effie's iron and AU's gold. She got the origami hands that can play like the fold. Love for sale, I'm sold, I'm sold. Boys, don't be afraid of a high IQ. A girl with smarts knows what to do. She reads Masters and Johnson and Kinsey too. Boys, do I lie?
Send and have a Brit with like Emma Thompson. You can use Iron Ink to cut and slate. And you can have the chunky glasses like Tina Fey. You better like films by Kurosawa. You better stay naked outside the shower. Better ding, dang, dingle for over an hour. Then calculate binomials to the 10th power. Brains, body, body. Stick out my candle. She knows which one is hiding and which, which one is handle. So baby, put on a dress that barely fits. Pound and shake your ass and show me your wits. Brains, body, ball. Brains, body, ball. Brains, body, ball. Brains, body, ball. Brains Body Both by George Robb. My sentiments exactly. Thank you for joining me on this episode of the Wow Signal Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this discussion on Bracewell Probes, and I do want it to be a discussion. We'll dig more deeply into this topic in the near future. I want to emphasize again that your questions and feedback on the podcast are really important. Please leave a comment on the blog at wowsignalpodcast.com or on iTunes, or join us in the Wow Signal Podcast community on Google+. You can also email wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com, and if you like, we can record an audio version of your feedback for inclusion in a future episode. I hope you will subscribe to this podcast. It's absolutely free. Just go to wowsignalpodcast.com and click on subscribe for free for instructions. It's easy and you can use any software you like, Miro, iTunes, Stitcher, and so on. We were just recently added to the Windows 7 podcast store as well. I'll see you again in about two weeks with a podcast that once again takes a hard look at the Fermi Paradox and the Drake Equation. Either listen to episode two, or refer to my blog at disownedsky.blogspot.com for more information, there will be links in the show notes. I'd like to thank Joyce Abma and Aaron Carr for their contributions to this episode, as well as our musical contributors, DJ Spooky, Jason Robinson, Sleep Research Facility, George Hrob, and Mevio Music Alley, which provided the MP3 of George Hrob. And now, here's DJ Spooky again to take us out. This has been Episode 5 of the WOW Signal Podcast. The spoken content of the WOW Signal Podcast is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license. All music is presented with the permission of the artists. To comment on this episode or for more information about Bracewell probes or the music in this podcast, please visit the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com.